morning. I'm Deborah Bogar, facilitator for this one-hour NACD Urban and Community Conservation Webinar on a successful community wildlife, wildfire preparedness program from the uh, state of Washington. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on NACD's website along with a presentation PDF for your future access. Everyone should be connected online to see the presentations and you can access audio via your computer or by phone. Those directions were sent with your confirmation email. As this opening slide indicates, all lines are muted except for the speakers. I'll open the chat area after the presentation so you can type in your questions and comments, and we'll take as many as we can. You might want to jot those down during the presentation. In this webinar system, the transitions will take a few seconds as the slides load, so don't worry that it's your computer. We'll start with comments from our host, Ron Rohal, chair of NACD's Urban and Community Resource Policy Group, which is the subcommittee of our National Resource Policy Committee. Ron? And good morning, and I welcome all of you to our monthly webinar of the Urban and Community Conservation uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> this is not a good morning at all, folks. Okay, let's just start over with this one. Okay, good morning, and I welcome all of you to the monthly Urban and Community Conservation Webinars offered by the National Association of Conservation Districts through the support of our sole sponsor, the Scott's Miracle Grow Company. These sessions are designed by NACD's Urban and Community Resource Policy Group, a subcommittee of district officials and partners charged with guiding the association services and support for districts' work in developed and developing areas. Our goal through these webinars is to help districts share what they are doing nationwide and enable them to learn from each other and various agencies and organizations. And we appreciate the support of the Scott's Miracle Grow Company for making them possible. I invite you to let us know what you think about each webinar and what other topics you would like us to cover by contacting NACD staffer Deb Bogar. And please, Tell our NACD officers what type of assistance you would like from your National Association for your urban and community conservation work. And now I'll hand it over to Deb for the introduction of our speakers. All right. Today we have four speakers from the state of Washington sharing one presentation. Kelsey Mote, Natural Resource Planner, joined the Whitby Island Conservation District team as Marketing, Education, and Outreach Coordinator in the fall of 2016. Earlier this fall, she transitioned her role into Natural Resource Planner. Kelsey manages the FireWise program, along with providing technical conservation planning assistance to forest landowners and farm landowners, and is working to strengthen connections among the island's agricultural producers through the WID Whidbey Island Growers Association. Kelsey has a master's in environmental education with a certificate in leadership and nonprofit administration from Western Washington University. David Wave, fire management forester, Northwest Region for the Washington Department of Natural Resources and a lifelong resident of Northwest Washington, has worked for the department since 2002 when he first started as a seasonal firefighter. After four years firefighting during the summer break from the University of Washington, David transitioned to a year-round role in the agency fighting fire, doing silvicultural forestry work, managing trails and campgrounds, restoration of natural areas, and ultimately transitioned into a full-time fire manager role in 2017. Amanda Newell, Education and Outreach Specialist, manages the Education and Outreach Program for the Cascadia Conservation District. Some of these efforts include a quarterly newsletter, coordinating the Kids in the Creek Outdoor Education Program, managing the FireWise Program, as well as participating in many outreach and education events throughout the year. Amanda has a bachelor's degree in communication with a minor in Latin American studies from San Diego State University. She also enjoyed study abroad, ter abroad uh, different terms in Costa Rica and Italy. 
Cindy Tanasket Ebel, Landowner Assistant Forester, Southeast Region, is a 20-year employee of the Washington State Department of Natural Resources. Whereas a forester, she has done everything from timber cell layout, wildland fire operations, to wildland fuels reductions for small landowners. She currently lives and works in central Washington. With that, I'm going to go ahead and load the slides for our speaker's presentation. And when they come up on your screens, uh, Kelsey and crew, go ahead and uh, take it from there. Well, welcome, everyone. Now, thank you for joining me and my partners today and sharing how we on both sides here in Washington State have worked to develop uniquely tailored wildfire preparedness, education, and outreach programs. So today we'll present to you how some of um, our partners, like local conservation districts, our state's Department of Natural Resources, local fire districts, and our federal partners, like the Forest Service and BLM, have come together to create programs that inspire private landowners individually, and as well as communities and neighborhoods to take an active role in wildfire preparedness. No matter where you may fare, wildfire can affect any of us. And today, we hope to impart on you some of the tenets to what makes, as you see here in our title, a successful community wildfire preparedness program with strategies and lessons learned from our years of work here in our locales. So as I'm sure many of you who are joining us today are likely fire professionals in some context or capacity, whether you're a firefighter, manager, scientist, or outreach specialist, as many of you probably experienced in your time in fire management, wildfire is present wherever you might be. Its place in an ecosystem is a natural phenomenon, and its purpose, multifaceted, right? To reduce fuels buildup, to build up the forest, open up the forest canopy and let in light, this promotes new plant species and helps reduce the fuel buildup, to release nutrients which have been held up for extended periods of time, to reset the soil column and control fungal and insect pests, and to increase ecosystem biodiversity and resilience. Wildfire regimes, the intervals between fire events, vary depending on the ecosystems where you live. You need heat, oxygen, and fuel, as you all know, to create fire and to influence its behavior across the landscape. Variables, including your topography, climate, and fuel types are part of that equation, too. When you look at wildfire scientifically, we all know it isn't so bad. But the cultural perception of wildfire, however, in our United States has for a large majority of the past century and a half stemmed from fire suppression policies, which were influenced by major fires that happened over 200 years ago. The image in that upper left of the slide depicts the damage from one of these major fire events which impacted our state of Washington. That picture is along the St. Joe River in northern Idaho and is from the Great Fire of 1910. This fire, like others before it, burned over 3 million acres in the states of North Idaho, western Montana, southeast British Columbia, and like I said, impacted the eastern part of our state here in Washington. Its destruction to life, which was actually 87 people killed, and the impact to the economy really set the tone for land managers, like our U.S. Forest Service, for how fire would be treated henceforth. Policies like the all fires out by 10 a.m. the next morning later influenced public campaigns like Smokey the Bears, only you can prevent forest fires. These are some of the most effective public campaigns in our nation's history, right? In turn, these policies and campaigns did, in fact, truly suppress fires, which helped to reduce further damage and destruction to natural resources and communities at the time. But however, from an ecosystem's perspective, this lack of wildfire activity in areas whose regimes were much more frequent ended up contributing to the growth of vegetation. And so why is that of concern? Fuel loading, altering ecosystems and how they function in natural states. So coupled with a drying and warming climate, increased fuel loading, and an increased wildland-urban interface, or as we all know in our profession, the WUI, and as growth of housing and development continues to encroach contiguous forests that are ripe with this wildfire hazard potential, we're now faced with the era of megafires. 
their roles, bringing back balance to these ecosystems, but also providing a significant wildfire hazard, as you can see in this heat map above and to the right, a lot of it being concentrated here in the West. So this history and what we currently face all sets the stage for the importance of developing a successful wildfire preparedness program, which you're likely to have come to learn about. And we hope to impart those tips that can help you in your own locale, influenced by your very own ecosystems, wildfire regimes, and community cultures. Washington State is located on the Pacific Northwest coast of the United States. Washington has a lot of variation in ecotypes, ranging from coastal and lowland temperate forests to high elevation forests in the Cascade Mountain crests, upwards of 6,500 feet. The dry shrub step deserts and dry forests are on the central and east side of the state. You can see these different geographic areas on the slide, with the coastal forests being rainforests. Excuse me. The coastal forests on the, the far west are rainforests that are influenced and moist from the moist air coming off the Pacific Ocean. The lowland forests are drier and located in the Puget Sound trough and around the greater metropolitan areas. These also include the islands within the Puget Sound. The mountain forests extend up above 2,500 feet in elevation on the west side of the Cascade Mountain Range. This mountain range is the result of the tectonic plates colliding underground, creating this whole string of snow-capped mountains, many of which are active stratovolcanoes. East side forests are on the east side of the Cascade Mountain Range and are dominated by ponderosa pine and lodgepole pine. And the shrub steppe area includes a mix of range and agricultural land with grass and sagebrush-dominated landscapes that extend vast areas. All these areas of Washington have their own unique composition of fuels based on climate and topography. This influences a variety of different fire regimes that change greatly depending on where you are in the state. Wildfire preparedness programs are an important part for all communities because regardless of where you live, it's not a matter of if but when the wildfire may occur. Think of the wildfire behavior triangle, as Kelsey mentioned earlier, fuel, topography, weather. The fuel characteristics and composition are different in all areas across the state, but it's still present and available to burn. The topography across the state's varied, but in general, there are steep slopes, canyons, and mountains that extend throughout. The weather is never static. Wind, temperature, and relative humidity seem to be the most dramatic weather variables that affect fire behavior. There are weather episodes throughout the year that cause fire escapement and wildfires that pose a risk to communities. The biggest challenge affecting all of Washington State's unique communities are its growing wildland urban interfaces, or the WUI. One recent study has shown that the WUI is the fastest growing land type in the contiguous western United States, with people building in areas that were historically unimproved. So obviously, where fire may have burned on regular intervals in the past, quick suppression of wildfires is required in order to protect timber resources and homeowners. So in Washington, we're seeing more frequent human fire starts coupled with longer and more dramatic dry summer periods. So unique to central and eastern Washington, uh, as David mentioned, uh, we are dominated by ponderosa pine dry type forests uh, and then sage uh, grass steppe. Uh, so we historically had the large, uh, sparse ponderosa pine. Uh, back in the day, you could drive a covered wagon through those. Um, those resulted from uh, low frequency, low intensity, uh, often frequent fires. Uh, let's see. And as David also mentioned, uh, one of our big challenges is uh, people moving into what was historically unimproved areas. So we had sort of larger areas to be able to fight the wildfires if we did get them. Um, so we do uh, also have uh, very dry, as, as stated, uh, we have some uh, 
climate that is considered desert. Uh, so we have dry, windy, and then lots of trees. So some context to, to the photo here. Um, this was taken um, from a lookout. Uh, the top one is 1934, and the bottom one is from 2010. Uh, so you can see that we had a much more open forest type in 1933. Uh, we had the low intensity frequent fires, which helped keep our ponderosa pine forests. Not only do we not have, do we have more trees, they're the wrong trees. Uh, so with the um, suppression of fire, we have more Douglas fir and true fir species that are growing in, uh, and these are all fighting for resources, uh, light and water in our dry sites here. Uh, so we have stressed trees, overstocked trees, which lead to disease and insect susceptibility. So the perfect storm for us is our overstocked stands, our dry weather patterns, and then our homes that are moving into our forest lands. So as Cindy mentioned, on the east side of the state, the problem's already there, and it's culturally and ecologically, it is more prevalent. But on the west side of Washington, there are dramatic changes becoming more of an issue, and, and, and many more landowners live on the west side of the state. Western Washington's temperate forests don't require fire to be healthy, like those ponderosa pine forests that Cindy talked about, but rarely and under perfect conditions they can and have experienced the spread of catastrophic wildfires. Historically, this would happen every few hundred years in a forest of this type, as opposed to maybe every 10 or 15 years or more frequent on the east side of the state. Recently, we've experienced warmer and drier summers in our state, even on this west side. The best strategy for wildfire prevention in the moist forest ecosystems of western Washington is to put fires out as soon as possible and never start them in the first place, especially during dry, hot, and windy conditions. The, the diagrams on this slide are meant to show how the warm, moist air comes off the ocean. Um, then clouds are formed and precipitation and evapotranspiration occurs, and the air on the leeward side of the mountains have less moisture and are much drier. So we have this on the large landscape scale in the Cascade Mountain Range, segmenting the west side and east side of the state. But we also have it at a smaller scale off of the Olympic Peninsula, where there's a rain shadow effect in the Puget Sound trough. So you can see in western Washington, there's areas that receive over 200 inches of rain per year, and others that receive less than 20 inches. This west side of the state, forests typically receive more moisture, thus contributing to this cultural perception that fire doesn't happen here. This presents its own unique challenge of public understanding and perception. This perception has changed some in the past few summers where western Washington residents have seen the impact from uh, the raging wildfires that have occurred throughout Washington, British Columbia, Oregon, and California and have created very smoky air quality conditions uh, throughout the west side of the state. And as we've stated before, you know, another unique challenge to our area is this growing population in the Puget Sound trough. We have 80% of our state's population approximately. Um, what's interesting about it is in western Washington, um, unlike eastern Washington, where these communities are kind of scattered throughout a large geographic region, this concentration of communities that uh, are encroaching on these wildland forests, also integrated with rural islands like where I live on Whidbey Island, really stretches fire suppression resources thin. Um, also, the populations being families and, and the elderly, there's uh, a larger vulnerability associated with folks when they're responding to fire events that may or may not happen. And just to provide you with some final context to setting the stage for these fire pro uh, prevention programs, interestingly enough, our most recent fire season this past, uh, you know, 2019, had actually 20% more fires than the previous five-year average. It didn't really feel like it because of the temperate conditions that existed this summer, um, but 
what that meant really that was the average fire size was only about one quarter the size of those mega fires that happened in previous summers that David mentioned in BC, in western Washington, and in other areas. Um, so we did have more fires this year, pro uh, providing a, a basis and justification for the importance of these programs that we're about to tell you about. So in western Washington, we can continue to see more fires in that WUI environment that are directly threatening homes and other developments. While the fires don't move as quickly as those in central and eastern Washington, they can burn very intensely. This, coupled with the complexities of poor ingress and egress of narrow roads and driveways and the buildup of brush and other fuel directly adjacent to homes, it stretches the capability of suppression resources to be available to respond and protect those improvements. By using close coordination with rural fire districts on fire response and outreach tools such as the FireWise USA program and having communities working with their disaster preparedness specialists to create community wildfire prevention plans and other documents, we have seen a lot of improvement in these areas. These plans turn out to be invaluable in the event of a wildfire occurring. In fact, on one recent fire response that I was acting as the initial attack incident commander for, I was able to notify the local fire chief of the concerning situation that this uncontrolled fire was spreading towards the community along a steep, heavily forested hillside. He was able to work with the community members to account for all of the residents. Uh, they encouraged voluntary evacuations and had structure protection in place around the homes in an incredibly efficient manner all by utilizing his knowledge of what this community had already prepared for uh, prior to the fire ever occurring. Once the DNR's initial attack of the fire had curtailed the fire spread, the incident management team utilized this community's FireWise plan and used an alternate egress road, which the community members had been maintaining for over a decade. They also used a, a pond within that community for shuttling water to the fire to support the mop oper operations for several days. So, you know, this example in my mind was a success story. It was a stressful and hectic situation where firefighters and community members, um, they all knew what to do and they ultimately led towards the best result possible. So uh, our partnership with Cascadia, the conservation district here in central Washington, uh, has been ongoing. Um, they've done some uh, roving chipper events for us that we do a contract for them with. Um, so when we were tasked with uh, trying to engage landowners and communities in uh, becoming a firewise communities, uh, the DNR lacked the capacity to be able to do that here. Um, so knowing that uh, Cascadia had uh, forestry experts already on staff, it allowed us to partner with them more easily. Um, so that was sort of the, uh, I guess, the start for this project. We just lacked the funding, or we had funding, but no personnel to be able to do this. And I just wanted to add that there are training opportunities available for the efforts like the home fire risk assessments. I can talk a little bit more about those on the next slide. Um, and then some of the other events, like the Roving Chipper Program, it really just takes kind of some organization and event planning uh, type experience. So I would just say to other districts, if you don't have a forester on staff, don't be intimidated by working with your local DNR to get some of these programs going. So a little more information about um, some programs that we've used to engage the public. So like I mentioned, the home fire risk assessments, that's where we go out and meet with landowners and walk around their property and their home and uh, kind of identify some of their risk areas and then provide some tips for them on how to reduce those risks. Uh, also offering a cost share program, so either 50-50 cost share or we sometimes can offer up to 75% of the cost um, for that fuels reduction work. And then the FireWise USA's program, this is a national recognition program that a community would come together for and uh, go through a process to become a recognized community, and then they have to renew that process every year. So there's a series of steps. Uh, 
so that kind of keeps that community organized and um, cohesive and able to make an action plan for the next wildfire that comes through or preparing for that. Uh, also, community wildfire protection plans. Uh, in Chelan County, we created one of these per fire district um, back in like 2004, 2005, and then ideally they would be updated annually. This hasn't happened for most of them just due to lack of funding and lack of capacity. Uh, but a few of them have been updated, and it's mostly the action plan that we want to update every year. Uh, but the plan itself gives a lot of great background, history, um, types of you know forests and risk factors for each of those fire districts. We have all of them on Cascadia's website, so if you're interested, feel free to contact me. I can direct you to that as an example. Um, and then other events and outreach tools that we've used, like Cindy mentioned, the roving chipper program. Uh, that's a way for landowners that maybe just have an acre or two of property and wouldn't qualify for a large-scale cost share fuel reduction project to just get some of the material around their home chipped for free, um, you know, making them a little bit more fire resistant or resilient. Um, Community events, we like to go to like local Firewise days that the communities have and Earth Day fairs, um, community meetings, and just have information about offering home fire risk assessments, offering the chipper program, and just kind of general tips on preparing your home for a wildfire. Uh, we try to utilize our website and partner websites and Facebook pages to promote wildfire preparedness tips. Um, other resources, local contractors that can do um, chipping and other fuels reduction work for folks. And then we try to have, uh, and we do a quarterly newsletter here at Cascadia, and we try to have a Firewise or Wildfire Preparedness type article two or three times a year. Uh, and then go on the local radio station to promote programs like the chipper and the uh, assessments and just, again, also give kind of those random tips. So like I was saying on the last slide, you really don't have to have a designated forester on staff to be getting these messages out to folks and you know still have a successful FireWise program, even if you can't offer maybe that technical assistance that uh, like a cost share program would. But that's a great way to partner with CNR or NRCS. Uh, they also offer cost share programs. So, you know, Amanda and really covered it um, really well. In terms of gaining engagement in these wildfire preparedness programs, Western Washington um, programs really do mirror some of these success, uh, successful strategies. You know, what's interesting about our side of the state is oftentimes who leads the charge in getting these programs started can often vary. Um, we've had a lot of local fire district staff who've taken charge on getting programs implemented, a lot concentrated in certain regions like the San Juan Islands. Um, sometimes it's conservation district staff. Sometimes it's the Department of Natural Resources DNR staff, too. Um, and what's interesting also to the western Washington side of the state is that some of these programs are relatively new, um, and some of them are, as you know, you heard Amanda, Amanda say, hers has been in existence for, you know, over 15 years. So lots of a lot of uniqueness here. But ultimately, kind of summarizing a bit of what Amanda said too is, there's like fourfold approaches to these outreach and education programs that are really successful. I'd say, if anything, this is one of those golden nuggets I'd write down if you're one who's considering building or expanding or kind of rechecking uh, your education and outreach program strategy. And the first of that fourfold approach is individually helping those landowners through offering of assessments to their properties, really providing those specific practices that they can implement to reduce their wildfire risk on their properties. The idea is you start with the individual, you provide them with that individualized attention, and ultimately they tell their neighbors about you if they had a successful encounter with you. And then that neighbor tells the next neighbor, and then that next neighbor tells the next neighbor, and the more those individual 
individual connections are made, the more impactful that program can be. It may take a while, but it really can be effective. Uh, that second of the fourfold approach, um, as Amanda kind of mentioned, and that you know both sides of the state implement, is that community level support. And there's different models you know that can be adopted, but that common successful strategy presented by the National Fire Protection Association's Firewise US, uh, USA program is really great about collaboratively bringing folks together in the community to work to reduce their wildfire risk with you and your partners as the catalysts, as the folks who help guide these natural leaders, folks that just need a little bit of extra help. Um, and the more that they work together, the more impact, right? Um, the third of that fourfold strategy beyond individual and community is uh, going a step higher and working with your local county Department of Emergency Management, uh, your regional firewise coordination efforts, your state, even your federal partners who often own a lot of that wild land that communities abut, and really participating actively in those uh, planning sessions, the natural hazard mitigation plans, which counties are often required to update every five years. I know my county is in the process of renewing theirs from five years ago. Um, so sitting at the table, being active and present with what their needs are, listening, participating, uh, developing these strategies on a really um, high geographic level helps influence that individual and community attention level. And lastly, providing that consistent presence in the community, you know, really an important part of getting um, a program up and running and maintaining is changing the community culture. And you can't do that sitting in your office. You got to get out there. You got to utilize the, uh, you know, means necessary, whether it's in person at events, um, tabling, uh, education events, you know, providing a presence digitally. Uh, on social media, Facebook, Instagram, reaching the different, you know, age demographics, getting them excited, getting the print newspapers out. Um, it's really important to remain consistent and diligent and really strategizing about how to efficiently use your time in managing those fourfold approach. So the, the DNR offers many wildfire prevention and preparedness programs to children and various communities across the state. Um, one promising vision that I wanted to point out is that uh, it, this vision is becoming a reality in DNR where there's a creation of a whole new um, forest health and resiliency division within the agency. And so this is separate from the wildfire suppression side of our agency. And we are excited to see this type of community fire preparedness work expand in the coming years uh, with the creation of this division. And um, again, I just want to reiterate that the, the key to success is creating these partnerships between the different agencies and entities and communities out there. Um, that, that is what is going to form the core of your successful wildfire preparedness program. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our weekend warriors. So specifically in Chelan County, we have a lot of second homeowners. And so um, just some tips for engaging those harder to reach communities and landowners. Uh, we find that, you know, when folks come over to their second home, they want to relax, enjoy the forest, enjoy the beautiful scenery, go on a hike, go boating. They don't want to work on their property the whole weekend. So uh, we try to make our events and efforts as um, second homeowner friendly as possible. So if we do do outreach events, we'll do them on a weekend with food, kind of have it be like a casual barbecue and open house type setting. Seems to attract, attract folks better. Um, also getting to know the local hangouts for weekenders is helpful. We have a local hardware store that's also like a little fun shopping center and coffee stop and everything. So that's a great place for us to advertise. They also host a farmer's market on Saturdays in the summer. Um, and then we offer our programs so that landowners do not have to be present to have a home fire risk assessment done. They can just ask us for one and give us permission to go out on their property. It's not ideal. It's better to be able to walk around with the landowner there. But you know, we still can give them a pretty good comprehensive report, even if they're not present. 
And then the chipping work, uh, the way that that works, it is a cost share program, so the landowner is responsible for doing the work to get their piles prepared for chipping, but then they don't have to be there for the chipper to actually come through and take care of their piles for them. Uh, so that seems to help, you know, with the participation there that they don't have to be sticking around on like a Wednesday for the crew to come through and actually do the work. Uh, we also really look to the full-time neighbors to be kind of our firewise champions or spark plugs in the area and connect with those absentee neighbors. Uh, we find that the neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor contact is more helpful than just having a, a government entity step in and be offering these programs. But if, you know, if the folks aren't from this area and aren't familiar with Cascadia and our partners, uh, they're a little more put off than just having a neighbor say, hey, look at this great program I've participated in. Uh, so again, kind of, you know, empowering those local champions and spark plugs. And we do offer some mentoring for them as well. Uh, we'll go to local HOAs and other organized community groups for those full-time residents and, um, you know, talk to them about FireWise and the efforts that we have and how they can talk to their neighbors. We provide them with the materials that they need. Um, work with them to get small grants for supplies or maybe community signs, uh, doing a local chipping program or field production program just for their smaller community. And then the Fire Adapted Communities Learning Network is another great way for folks to participate from other parts of the state as well. So um, either they can be a part of that network and access materials from anywhere in the country or the world. Uh, and then that's a way for for the firewise communities to kind of keep in touch with um, with the other the local folks that they don't see all the time. So, what's next? Continuing momentum after the first years um, after becoming a recognized firewise community, and really what we see is that it comes down to the firewise board and the the landowners that created the community in the first place. Um, Firewise is a very landowner-driven effort. Uh, you really need that key person in the community to keep things going. Uh, as I mentioned before, there's a series of steps, and we've helped uh, communities get through those steps to become recognized nationally. But then they're kind of, you know, having to take it from there and renew every year. They have to host an annual Firewise Day. Uh, and we try to keep in touch with them as much as we can. We'll go to the local Firewise Days for the communities. Um, we try to host an annual get-together for all the community leaders in Chelan County. Um, we check in as often as we can and forward on any opportunities for you know, trainings and grants and whatever we have chipping and assessment programs going on. Um, but yeah, the, the more and more we're into this program, it really does depend on the landowners. We've had, you know, some communities that have been going strong for 10 plus years and uh, have actually become their own nonprofits and host their own chipping days and, uh, you know, are able to have some of their funds through their HOAs come through to help their firewise efforts. And then others that, you know, maybe were going strong for a year or two and then the person moved out of the area and there hasn't been anyone as committed to that community to, to take it up and keep going with it. So we always encourage people to have like three or four people on a board so that if someone does move or if someone does decide to step down, you've still got those committed folks. Uh, but that's probably the, the biggest hurdle we have here is is maintaining the momentum if, if someone moves out of the area. So uh, recently, um, Cascadia applied for and received a grant from the, the DNR to re-engage the uh, existing Firewise communities, uh, just check in with them and, and, and see if they have lost that spark plug, what we can do for them. Um, so that's the next step for us also. So opportunities are available. Just got to keep searching for them, which we all understand in the conservation district world. All right, so celebrating success, uh, we, Cascadia, did a Firewise Challenge with DNR uh, back in 2015-16, and that was where we had funds from DNR to work with 10 communities to get them 
through the whole FireWise recognition process, so a big push to get communities through that national program. Uh, we ended up working with 16 that year. And the way we did that is we met with a local group of landowners, those folks you see on the screen there, that were very committed, and we took the whole map of the Plain Lake, Lake Wenatchee area, which is a fairly significant size. I don't know if the exact acreage or anything off the top of my head, but um, several different communities and just kind of broke it up and assigned a willing leader uh, to take it and run with that community. And Washington State ended up leading the nation for new firewise communities in 2016, and Chelan County led Washington State. So that's kind of our claim to fame for that year. That uh, this had been after years and years of building this program with DNR, with local communities, uh, so that it, you know, it wasn't something that just that one year, we all of a sudden decided to have a FireWise program and ended up getting 16 communities. Uh, it's definitely a work in progress, but um, you know, made possible by the community coming together, um, you know, and then having those startup funds from DNR. Uh, and then, so kind of where those folks are now, some of the leaders from those smaller communities have formed an executive board to kind of manage the whole Plain Lake Wenatchee area firewise communities. And they were uh, accepted as a fire adapted communities pilot program a couple of years ago. So they've still got good momentum going up in that area. Uh, they're kind of our all stars as far as Chelan County goes. Um, kind of the example that we set when we're working with new communities. Um, they've also been great mentors for, for new communities. So, uh, again, just kind of reiterating how important those spark plugs, local FireWise champions are um, to the success of this program. So to share with you a success from the west side, I'd like to take you back also to the 2016 kind of calendar year time frame um, using Whidbey Island Conservation District, um, my conservation district, our partner um, David at the Department of Natural Resources and our local fire districts, primarily our central Whidbey Island Fire and Rescue District in the central part of the island as our pilot district. Um, we utilized a one-year implementation grant from our Washington State Conservation Commission uh, to bring together the three partners um, and develop a strategy as to how we were going to outreach about the importance of wildfire preparedness to our communities on, on the island. Um, we started actually by developing a localized uh, GIS-based wildfire hazard ranking matrix and map which kind of helped us to prioritize which communities within our pilot fire district were going to be the ones we wanted to target first. Kind of the idea of wanting to get the biggest bang for our buck by educating those who had the greatest risk, essentially, to fire. And what, you know, typically tends to happen, um, especially in rural islands like mine, um, is that these communities which were most at risk were those which were situated along the bluff zones of the western side of uh, uh, Whidbey Island. Um, typically, the risk associated with the fact that they are in these forested areas, very a lot of, of fuel loading built up on the west side because of our precipitation um, and plant growth, and then Subsequently, in the summertime, the drying of those fuels and the, the winds that come off the Pacific Ocean straight, straight hitting our uh, west side of, of Whidbey Island. Um, so, you know, what we did is after getting that wildfire hazard ranking matrix and identifying some specific communities, uh, we followed a diversified program approach, like I mentioned earlier, that fourfold approach, and also which Amanda and Cindy have done. Um, we engage the local landowners individually and homeowners. I have a lot of connections being that I'm based out of Whidbey Island with the community, really taking advantage of that to identify those spark plugs um, within those at-risk um, communities we targeted. Um, and we, you know, got on the, on the annual meeting schedules to provide our program resources to hit the most people in those communities. Um, we even worked to provide a, a FireWise Day event where we brought in a speaker um, from the National Fire Protection Association, 
uh, worked with the Washington State University Extension Forestry Program and our local would-be communal land trust um, to couple these expertise, you know, build on each other's strengths and share that with the public uh, to engage the general population in wildfire awareness. Um, you know, I see all these elements of this approach in 2016, which has continued uh, to this day as, as our big major success celebration. Um, and then, you know, essentially in that initial year of our grant, uh, we ended up targeting nine homeowners associations with presentations. We had over 40 folks, which is quite a bit for Whidbey Island, I'll just tell you that, um, at our Firewise Day event. And we reached over 5,230 people with an uh, individualized mailer that we sent out, and likely 8,000 more individuals through newspaper articles that we developed. And I'd say that the icing on the cake of this success story in that initial year in 2016 was when, as a result of all that outreach, and typically as things happen here on Woodby Island, it ends up being through word of mouth and connections, is we ended up getting Sierra Country Club. Um, you can see the homeowners up there in the upper left, uh, Lynn, Fran and Diane and several others in the community, they latched on to this idea of becoming a nationally recognized Firewise community. And so we worked with them as a result of that initial year and have continued to work with them um, to follow that model. And in 2018, they got recognized as Island County's first Firewise program. Uh, and as a result of that effort, they've been building their program to reach out to neighboring communities along those forested bluff slopes where they're all situated. And now we're working with several other communities who are likely to be our next communities for, for national recognition. You know, obviously Sierra Country Club has those inherent leaders and it really does take those folks. You saw in Amanda and Cindy's example, it, it does take those initial folks who intrinsically see the value in having education programs. But if you cultivate that relationship with them and you continue to provide you know, guidance and support to them and regularly stay in contact, they're going to do a lot of the work for you. And, and celebrating them is, is one of those, hence why I'm sharing that success with you today. And I'm going to let them know I did. <laughs> um, and ultimately, you know, Programs come and go a lot of times. They're dictated by funding. Um, we have been fortunate here at my conservation district after that initial grant implementation year um, to have some support of funds allocated from our State Conservation Commission to continue to maintain our program, um, and as well as our Department of Natural Resources and Fire Districts continuing to support uh, their staff in partnering with us and providing essentially a consistent and enduring presence in a community. It doesn't, you know, necessarily demonstrate success that you get 100 communities done in a year and then all of a sudden your funding goes away and your program's gone and now there's nothing. Really, even if it's just a few communities, uh, a handful of homeowners, a cultural shift because you've provided that consistent presence and an efficient use and strategic use of your funding to maintain those programs and be open to working with each other to find other sources, you're going to have that enduring success. And, and so that's really what I'd like to share in terms of our West Side, one of many examples of success. Um, one thing that I'm advocating for uh, working in the DNR in the northwest portion of the state is to bring together a wildfire preparedness uh, group of partners early in the year of 2020. And this would be kind of following that model of the Fire Adapted Communities Learning Network where, where we're identifying all the different players in the fire preparedness landscape, which will include the DNR, the Forest Service, fire chiefs, uh, county emergency managers, conservation districts, um, and the list goes on and on. Um, but really the goal will be to develop initial plans for better coordination of efforts uh, throughout Northwest Washington in the future. And in doing this, I hope it more accurately defines where success can be made in fire preparedness efforts and to help formulate a consistent 
message and strategies uh, for all the collaborators to utilize when out there doing fire preparedness work. So this is really the golden nugget slide, and we wanted to leave it till last so that y'all stayed with us. <laughs> Uh, we do really appreciate you taking this hour out of your day to learn with us more about how our journeys, both on the central eastern side of the state and the western side of Washington State, have had some similarities, some differences, and how we've worked to cultivate and continue to cultivate these programs. So here's what I'd like to leave with you. My partners and I have strategized and right, tried to take those golden nugget steps. Um, so if anything, you've, if you've not taken notes, this is where to do it. Um, so what, what to do now? Um, you know, regardless, obviously, of where you're situated or what organi organization you represent or what your wildfire risk is, these are the top eight tips for strategies for success. And I'd say, you know, these are in order and then they can be iterative and kind of repeat themselves as you grow in your program. Um, you know, the first step, designate a lead coordinator and someone whose personality is a collaborative one. Um, that might be you. That might be you because you're sitting in and you're interested and you want to continue to refine or build your program. So designate someone who can be that lead coordinator who is willing to put forth the effort to be collaborative. You know, the second is to then network and recruit your key partners. You know, build your toolkit and play on each other's strengths. Um, for example, you know, your partners might include your agency fire management and forestry partners for your state, like for us, the Department of Natural Resources, local fire districts and chiefs or even volunteers for the fire district, your local soil and water conservation districts, county emergency managers, federal land agencies like the Forest Service, the BLM, tribes, national parks, and more. But it's about playing on each other's strengths and trying to remove duplication. What can your department bring to the table? What can mine? And working to bring those together as a toolkit to send outwards. The third of those eight tips, develop an actual strategy based on that collaboration and strength building. You know, making sure to solicit feedback through regular in-person communications and trying to intentionally align your programmatic goals and your funding sources and being transparent about those funding sources in terms of your capacity and working to, you know, work within that. Um, there's efficiency in that. You know, the fourth, so kind of halfway through these steps, uh, prioritize your audience and geographic region like what we did here on uh, Whidbey Island with DNR and the fire districts. We developed that risk map, which was influenced by a lot of the mapping from our state and other localized resources. Um, you know, by prioritizing your audience, you're going to, like you said, get the biggest bang for your buck, and you're going to reach those people who are most at risk starting forward. Develop your program with a clear, concise deliverable on, uh, you know, achievable timelines that are tailored to your audience. Uh, having those deliverables that are achievable and have a timeline is going to keep you on track. And if you know your audience or if you've not yet gotten to know your audience, maybe you're new in your community, try to locate people who can help you understand what uh, their strengths and cultures are so you can tailor it. The six of those eight steps, follow through. Do what you're going to say, say and do what you're going to do, right? Um, we know this. You know, this requires efficient use and long-term pursuit of funding. Be diligent. Work with your partners to identify opportunities together. You know, essentially, we like consistency as folks, right? And if we're just there for a short bit and we leave, folks are going to be weary of us. So build that trust through consistent follow-through on what you say you're going to do and be knowing of what, what you're capable of. Um, so the seventh of those eight strategies, revisit that strategy regularly. We've evolved even in the three years of our program. We're one of the more fledgling ones in, in our state. 
we've revisited our strategy. We've held on to the things that we've seen are successful, but we're open to feedback from our communities and incorporating new ideas into this long-term programmatic strategy. And lastly, make sure to recognize the successes that do happen. If, if things are happening and fail get, failed to present those to the greater community, um, that momentum is going to wane a little bit. So really making sure to honor those folks who've put in that effort, uh, communities, landowners, leaders, your partners, um, just make sure to recognize those successes and offer up opportunities where you all can reflect back on your successes and also moving forward what you might want to do next. So with that, you know, I just want to encourage you all to get in touch with uh, David, myself, Amanda, Cindy. We are happy to be resources to you. That's the strength behind these programs is the networking. Um, make sure to reach out to us. We've listed here our websites where you can access our contact information. You can go to the Woodby Island Conservation District, Cascadia Conservation District, uh, our state's Department of Natural Resources. Uh, northwest and southeast fire regions, and uh, we'd love to help you. And I'd like to leave you with kind of a final thought, you know, inspired by wildfire science. You know, just as these overlapping home ignition zones that folks live in that have that risk demonstrate to us that need for individual landowners and homeowners to work collaboratively on this preparedness measure, so too do we as those agencies and organizations spearheading our outreach and education charge. We need to work collaboratively in order to truly get our ecosystems back into balance and empower our public to be stewards of their natural resources. So thanks for having us today. All right. Well, Kelsey, David, Amanda, and Cindy, thank you. I think that was really a great presentation. And I get excited to see that kind of partnership that's occurring uh, around the country. Uh, for our audience, I've now opened up the chat room. If you look down in the lower left corner of your computer, there's a small box where you can type in your question or your comments and then hit enter. And as those come in, uh, if we get any, um, I'll read them aloud, capture them in the recording, and then refer them to our speakers. And while we're waiting for a few minutes to see if uh, anybody's got thoughts to share. Um, folks, your presentation was so thorough that I was noting I'd been jotting down a few questions, and you answered those. So, Oh, great. <laughs> great. It was excellent. Uh, but I will take a moment. At the beginning of the presentation, Kelsey, I believe it was you talking and giving some of the historical, you and David, uh -huh. and you talked about the major fire that occurred that was multi-state. Um, mm -hmm. This fall, I just read Timothy Egan's book, The Big Burn, about yeah. fire in 1910. Is that the one that you were talking about? Yes, that is. For our audience, then, that's a fascinating book. Oh, my gosh, the history on that, the politics, everything that occurred during that time. And it's even more exciting for me, though, to... to to look at how things have turned around, the partnerships that are occurring, um, so much different from back then. You know, the growth of the individual entities and their ability to, to partner, and the work that's been done to address wildfire. So that's one thought to share. And then um, I guess I would ask this, and if maybe all of you might want to address it. We've seen so much about wild, you know, the wildfires that have been occurring for years now, uh, particularly here in the West. Um, because of that, I would think every landowner would want to jump on board and firewise or do something to their land to, to help uh, modify that. Are you still running into people that are reluctant to do this? And if so, how do you deal with that? Maybe start with the west side first. Um, David and Kelsey, and then go to the east side. Sounds great. Yeah, so, I mean, on Whidbey Island, if you've never been here before, there's definitely a cultural barrier there. Um, 
for us, it's a lot of folks who very much value uh, the, the vegetation, the beauty of the native plants here and the communities present, and oftentimes the misconception. I know that we found that when we initially did our implementation year of the program, the thought that we were going to come in and ask folks to take out all their trees or clear out all their you know native plants that they've loved and really enjoy and so you know the the cultural st perception still persists but we've noticed through the continued presence and consistency with our outreach both to the general public and really targeting those homeowner association leaders who then you know, have a positive experience with us and get the word out in their own outreach ways within their communities, that that shift is, is happening. But it takes time. It takes that consistency. Um, it really is important to have that presence and be at the table in those communities. So that's one, one example for, for us here locally. All right. And then Amanda. So yeah, here in central Washington, um, I think some of the resistance uh, simply comes from uh, landowners not knowing that their forests that they live with in western Washington shouldn't look the same as they do in eastern Washington. Um, it's just an education thing, I think. Um, and some of it is, you know, we talked about the weekend warriors. It's their second home, and they don't want to come over here and have to deal with that. Um, so the education I'm talking about is that, yeah, we have very different forest types in western Washington and eastern Washington. And, you know, so just getting people to recognize that, that if you have that, mu that many trees in your vacation home, that's not good. Okay, great. Thank you both. We've had a couple of uh, comments or a comment and a question come in, which I'll read, and then uh, we may go ahead and close out. From Kelly in Pennsylvania, I live in a FireWise community, but sadly grant funding for the program is no longer available. Thank you for some great ideas to keep it rolling despite reduced funding capacity. Great presentation. And I'll echo that. And then from Candace down in, Candace, I think you're North Carolina. Um, you mentioned engagement with the local natural hazard mitigation planning process. Have you had any success receiving hazard mitigation grant funding from FEMA for wildfire mitigation projects identified in those plans? Um, I'd be happy to jump in there. So, Candace, we're still relatively new to this process. I brought that up because of the fact that that's been a more recent um, addition to our report in the community. I am aware that our local county does source some of their funding for these hazard mitigation planning updates from FEMA. And really, it's coming down to building the relationship with our Department of Emergency Management. So we're working on those conversations. We're not too aggressive, um, but we're looking over the next five years as they, you know, sorry, the next two years as they're working to update their five-year plan to see if we can't in, uh, integrate, you know, some opportunity to funnel that towards us, but we really want to bring to the table, you know, this is what we can offer that's, you know, uh, in addition to what you're doing that's going to complement that. Okay. And then did anybody else want to comment on that while we're waiting for, oh, here we go. From Jenny, um, I think she's responding to Candace, conservation districts have to be annexed into the NHMP in order to apply for FEMA funding. And this, this is David here, and, and I work pretty close with Jenny, and she works with Skagit and Whatcom Conservation Districts, but it it's, was neat to see in the latest update at Skagit that the Conservation District really took the lead in um, rewriting their community wildfire prevention plan for the county. So there again you see that partnership model that we're, we're trying to point out um, where the county emergency managers might not have had the expertise in this wildfire risk discussion, but the conservation district did. Great point. And it shows why it's so important to be at the table, no matter what's going on, um, you know, what kind of issues or partners are out there. You need to be at the table. 
Uh, so Candace says thanks and just uh, follow up, up on that with it may be another funding source resource to check out. I see Jenny's, uh, oh, Jenny, great presentation. I, again, echo that. And since we're getting five minutes after the hour, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up here. If I talk slow enough, there we go. From Matthew, we got thank you. So uh, another huge thank you to uh, Cindy and Amanda and David and Kelsey. Uh, great information that you've shared. It's uh, incredible or exciting to see that kind of a partnership and the accomplishments because of it. And for our audience, um, remind you to check out the NACD website um, on our urban and community resources, as well as our net network on Facebook. And if you have something you'd like to share, um, you can send it to me and I can get it posted, and especially if you send a photo along with that. And then finally, Here's where I usually tell everyone about our next webinar, but unfortunately the speakers I thought I had lined up have not worked out, so I'm still in the process of um, looking for a group that's willing to talk about their project. Uh, it's kind of short notice because of the holidays, but we'll see what happens. So look, uh, if something does develop, I'll get a notice out to all of our past participants as usual. And with that, I'll wrap up with a happy holiday to everybody um, and look forward to seeing you next year. Bye now. Thank you.